The Whistler. Sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Whistler's strange story, Whirlpool. Marty South wasn't sure when it began. It was too much like walking in the middle of a nightmare and then remaining in it, living in it. The shipwreck, the confusion, it was all there again, coming back to him, but slowly, hazily. And there was a strange buzzing in Marty's ear, pressure, and the sound of the sea, whirlpool of confusion. And then gradually, out of the whirlpool, voices, dimly, faintly at first, but voices, growing, coming closer and closer. You coming around? You'll be all right, Captain. Mr. Sharp, you'll be close. But through it all, one thing seemed clear to Marty South, in focus. Those few swift minutes before the ship heeled over on its side, before he leaped for the lifeboat and missed, there was a girl. Yes, a girl standing in the companionway just outside her cabin. Marty remembered her face, her fair skin, her clear eyes, wild as he shouted at her frantically. Hey, don't stand there. Get up to the deck, the lifeboat. Boat? Oh, yes, I was just... Uh, wait a minute. Is anybody inside in the cabin? Cabin? There's... No... No, I'm alone. Then go on. Up those stairs. There isn't much time. Hurry. <clears throat> much time. Better going. I'm alone, Captain. Hastings. Mr. Hastings. You say, Mr. Hastings, I huh? got you in time. Can you hear me? I'm the ship's doctor. Hmm. You're on board the SS Aragorn down to Singapore. SS Aragorn? Yes, sir. Singapore? Here. Try to drink this, Mr. Hastings. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm all right. I made it. I made it. You sure did, Hastings. Hastings? Yeah, there couldn't be any mistake about his identity, Captain. Hmm? Oh, no. No, that's who he is. He's Hastings, Doctor. Sure. There's no doubt about it. His wife identified him. Oh, could you get her to come in, Captain? What? My wife? No, I... No, oh, no, just do that. You were suffering from shock, Mr. Hastings. Exhausting and severe shock. No, but... Uh, you come in, Mr. Hastings. My husband, you'll be all right, Captain. Uh, just come in, please. No. No, I don't have it. <laughs> You stop, Marty. The protest dying in your throat as you struggle up to one elbow. Look toward the door. It's the same girl, isn't it? The one you faced in the companionway and shouted at. But now she's coming towards you. Darling. Speaking differently. Very different. My darling, I was so afraid for you, but I told them you'd pull you when I told them who you were. What? I... A doctor, she isn't delirious. Don't worry, Mrs. Jason. Doctor. Yes, Mr. Hastings. Can you, can you leave us alone? Absolutely. Yeah, I want to be alone with my wife. And certainly. Captain, we'll wait on the deck. Anything you say. Okay. Now, 
Well, tell me what this is all about. But, darling, you shouldn't try to talk. Skip I'll... it. I can talk. Go pitch me out. I'm okay, see? Of course you are. The name's South. Like this or in a full dress suit. It's South. Marty South. It's a nice name. I like it. That's fine. You were? Mrs. Stephen Hastings of the Shanghai. You can call me Lucy. What about Mr. Hastings? My husband is dead. The one that didn't make it? The one that didn't make it. What happened to him? How come I you... don't know. Stop asking me. Stop looking at me like that. Like what? My husband, Stephen, like that. In the cabin, he first hit me on. He just sat there staring as if he was. Welcome to what? Chance to die? I don't know. You couldn't get him out? No, couldn't I couldn't. send anybody back in? I didn't think of something like that happening. I couldn't. You've been thinking since? Yes. Plenty of it. But, come on and wait. My husband, Stephen, has some money for him to get. It's waiting for him now in Singapore. Waiting for Mr. Hastings to pick it up. Any Mr. Hastings will do. 20,000 now, 30,000 in a couple of weeks, 50,000 altogether. Half of it could be yours. Yes. To begin with, how can you pass me off with your husband here on board? There are quite a few survivors, have they? Nobody knew Stephen. He stood with cabin half the board. Most of the others were picked up by the police. Oh, you see him in Singapore? No, the police is heading for the United States, and not a soul in Singapore knows that. Where did the money come from? From an old friend in Shanghai, E.J. Galloway, from a business company, my husband. You see, E.J. made a mistake on a business deal in Singapore, and I found out about it. And so soon, what the last day, he did. He got revenge. Take down. You must have felt great giving his old pal the black milk. Well, Stephen didn't have to do that. E.J. doesn't know we're the black milk. He thinks Stephen is with Go with me. See, this pick up the money in Singapore and make the pay out there to a man who's never seen it. You see, Singapore is where he is. Black man, you know. <laughs> nice guy. Your yeah. husband. He was, you can never see. But we heard of it. So we only got sick sometimes, just thinking about it. About black men and the very And why'd you go ahead with me? Black me. Why? Oh, you don't know. That can be quite a few of Maybe. The guys like Stephen Hastings. But not guys like Martin Sam. You guessed it. <laughs> we'll see. If you get lonesome for me, guys. That's all, Marty, and then she's gone. Leaving you to think it over. But you know her kind. Lucille is a man trap. You figure she'll be back soon to try to help you make up your mind. But that's where you make a mistake, isn't it, Marty? She lets you rest the first. At first, you find yourself strangely sure. Then you think some more, and you decide not to say anything to them about her husband, Stephen Hastings. Money is the important item to you, too, isn't it? Yes. Half a day out of Singapore, you can't stand it anymore. You call the doctor and send for it. Just picking up how wonderful. I'm doing better than that. Thank you. Oh? You don't look as if you don't know why. And how nice you think. Well, Mr. Wanna know what I decided? I know. You like me. You know, I think you like me. You hit it with a first part. But get this. I know what I'm going into. To include you only because you're necessary to my immediate prosperity. I'm very necessary, darling. So as you're having a husband, Steve. Okay, I'll keep my eyes for you. Uh... Darling, I knew you were. Uh-huh. You could be smart, yeah, but here's something you don't know. Your husband made a big mistake when he fell in love with you. I'm not going to make the same mistake. I can't afford it. Oh? I never let love in the field with my friend. Uh, baby. Everything all right, Mr. Hastings? Huh? Oh, yes, fine, Doctor. Isn't it, dear? I guess so. Sure it is. And don't worry, darling, you'll feel better. Everything is going to be so much better. Soon. And now, back to the...
with a whistler. Decision, didn't you, Marty, about Lucille Hastings and the money waiting for Stephen Hastings in Singapore. That day aboard ship, when she suddenly thrust opportunity into your hands by asking you to pose as her dead husband, Stephen Hastings. But there's another thing you've decided on, and that's more important than anything else. You're not going to make the same mistake he did, are you, Marty? No. You're not going to fall in love with Lucille. Because that doesn't fit in with your plans at all. Money is still the most important thing, isn't it? Even though you don't have very much of it at the moment, and you've never let a woman interfere, you've never let your heart rule your head where money is concerned. The first night in Singapore, the two of you move easily around the dance floor of the Port Plaza Hotel. Seemingly the very devoted married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Hastings. Mm. You dance well, dear. Stephen's learned to dance better. <laughs> Much better. Maybe the poor guy was tired. He had a right to be. I think we should stop talking about that. Mm, suits me. Come on back to the table. Let's talk about when we go to work. All right. Good chair? Thank you. <sighs> No, no. Let's see. I think we'd best wait a day or two. You can go there Wednesday for the first meeting. The second will be ready in a couple of weeks. E.J. couldn't raise it all at once. Where do I go? Well, I'll have to look at E.J.'s letter again for the exact address. It's a little tailor shop somewhere on Ponderosa Street. No, you don't have to look again. Not with that memory. It's a tailor shop. But why Wednesday? No reason. I just think it's fair. All right. Hmm? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't get all this mystery. There isn't any mystery. If it. Galloway stood still for a 50 grand shakedown, why didn't he just give it to you, send it to you direct? Why all this movie stuff? Uh, this is my idea, not even. You see, in case you did couldn't raise the money, or change his mind, or decided to talk to the authorities, I thought it'd be much better for me if I were far away. With me, for the fall guy, if anything goes wrong here. There's nothing can go wrong here. There's no crime in having your coat on. What do I do when I get to this tailor shop? What do you do? You just have your patience. You can wait for it if you want to. Tell them you're Mr. Hayden. But if they want proof. <laughs> they can call the hotel and ask me to pay But they won't. Oh, relax, darling. Sorry, I can't relax. Not until I've had my coat done. <laughs> Morning, sir. I want to get this coat press. I'll wait for the main station. Oh, yes. And you are staying? The Port Plaza. Why? Nothing, Mr. Hastings. Just curious. If you're going to call or anything, my wife isn't there. She uh, can't stop. No, no, Mr. Hastings. Uh, your coat, please. I'll have it for you right here. Good. <laughs> You watch the proprietor of the little tailor shop as he takes his coat, moves off toward the back of the establishment. You look around nervously, ready to run for it if anything goes wrong. But nothing does now. He's back in a matter of minutes, isn't he? Handing a newly pressed coat across the counter. You pay him and slip it on. Feel the bulge of a heavy envelope in the inside pocket. Satisfactory, sir? I think so. Will you be dropping in again? Yeah. yeah. Perhaps if you'd call the day before. Oh, okay. We'll give you quick service, sir. Good morning. Half a block away, you open the envelope and look inside. It's there, isn't it? Twenty thousand dollars. You smile as you put it away. But there's still another payoff, another $30,000. It would be stupid of you to walk out now, wouldn't it? And then your pulse quickens and you glance back. You're certain someone's following you, aren't you, Marty? 
and you realize that Lucille is still thinking as fast as ever. If you guessed, you might pick up the money a day early, not wait until winter. You turn, hurry down the street on your way back to the hotel. You don't have to knock the door down. My old husband, what will the neighbors think? Never mind. And inside. Uh, that's all the excitement. What kind of a double cross is this? You had me follow, didn't you? Did I? The fat guy in a white suit. You gonna tell me what's going on? When you calm down, you might tell me. Well, I went there. It's like you said. The tailor shop? Yeah. Went through the whole routine. Didn't they give you the money? That's not the beef, Lucille. I'm talking about the guy who picked me up on the way out. One of your pals, huh? A high-powered insurance policy. You're not making sense, darling. If somebody followed you, it's because you're in Singapore. Stay out of the alleys, darling, in rough neighborhood. This is a big, bad city. Wish I could buy that. You can buy anything, Mr. Hastings. How much you get? 20000 Yeah, it's in the envelope. Pretty, isn't it? Darling. Yeah? Speaking of double crosses, I thought I told you not to go to the tailor shop until Wednesday. It's only Tuesday. <laughs> All right, Doctor. I'll forgive you this time. Will you? I'll try. Oh. <laughs> what are you thinking? Mm, something pretty foolish. But sometimes you'd really like to level. Mm. Darling, put your arms around me. What, so I can hold on to the sleigh ride? I wouldn't take you on a sleigh ride, wouldn't you? You'd take anybody on me. Marty, Marty. Marty. Too bad it's not for keeps, Lucille. Tomorrow it could be a knife in my back. Well, what if I said you want me to say it, but... I don't know, Your mind is spinning as you leave her, Marty. You're afraid, aren't you? Because the one thing you try to guard against is happening. Slowly, surely, you're falling for her. And you know what it can mean. You don't do anything about it the next day or in the days that follow. Just go along, trying to keep your head above water. Then one night, as you walk alone through the streets of Singapore, you catch sight of him again, the man she's had following you. Hurry forward, turn into an alley, and stop. And wait. Here I am, mister. Uh, what do you want? Uh, just a moment, mister. I just... I just wanted to talk it over. Talk what over? Why, the deal. I thought maybe you'd changed your mind the way you've been acting, avoiding me. Of course, this is a crazy setup. Oh? Uh-huh. I naturally thought you were going to meet me here when you got in last week and set it all up. Uh, naturally, but well, I almost forgot what you looked like. You didn't know what I looked like. You never saw me before. You made the deal with the man I worked for, remember? I think you'd better keep talking, Mr. Gray. Gray is good enough. Mr. Gray. Mm-hmm. Might be. Oh, I don't blame you for being careful, Mr. Hastings. Our deal like this. But how does this sound to you? You take your wife to the Red Angel Cafe tomorrow night. Just casually have dinner with her, the last one. Then stroll out on the terrace. The terrace? Yes. Hardly anyone ever there. Just give me a chance to get lined up and then light her cigarette. The match will give me a target. An easy one. What do you know? Stephen... It hit you suddenly. Stephen Hastings, the weakling. He'd actually set up a plan to kill her at the end of the voyage. A plan that he was too weak to go through with. Perfect, isn't it? You can get rid of your seal tomorrow night. And a few days later, you can drop around to the tailor shop, pick up the rest of the money, and leave town. But you're not sure that this is the way you want it to be, are you? Not even for $50,000. What is the matter, Mr. Hastings? You haven't changed your mind. Changed my mind? Well, uh, I would like a little more time to think it over. I've been doing some thinking. 
I want the five thousand dollars you agreed on, Mr. Hastings. Five thousand. Okay, we'll get it. Yes. Please leave it in your hotel box. Small, new bill. Cash. Yes, yeah, sure. It's great. Yes? If the money's in the box, tomorrow night, you'll see us, my wife and me, at the Red Angel Cafe. On the terrace? Yes. I'm to light the cigarette. That is right, Mr. Hastings. And uh, take your time thinking it over. And quite a decision for a man to make. In your position, I don't blame you. You will sleep on it. I don't mind waiting a little longer. And you do think it over, don't you, Mark? All night and all the next day. It's the hardest decision you've ever had to make. You remember Lucille's beauty, her lovely voice, the fun you've had together during the little time you've known her. Pleasant times you might have in the future. Then you remember her husband, Stephen. How she persuaded him to blackmail his best friend. How callous she was about her husband's death after the shipwreck. You recall how she lied to you at the time of the shipwreck when you asked her if there was anyone else in the cabin. And that lie made certain her husband's death. You also remember something else. The 20,000 she had. And the 30,000 she's expecting in a few days. And that evening... Darling, how did you know about this place? The Red Angel? Mm-hmm. I heard somebody mention. Like it very much. And I like you for joining me. Lucille, I... Oh. <laughs> you want to talk? Oh, come on. Where are we going? Out on the terrace. Oh, but... Oh, okay. Terrace. You can see the light in the water. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Marty, you, you were going to tell me something, is that it? Yeah, yeah, I was. I think I know what it is. You know, Marty, you're, you're not like Stephen, boy. You're anything but me. Except when it comes to putting this sort of thing to you. Oh, give me a cigarette, huh? What? I said, give me a cigarette. Anything wrong with that? No, no, no. Nothing wrong. Here you are. Thank you, Marty. You know, just the way you're looking at me, tells me something. You do love me, don't you? I don't know. Do I? Would you give me a light? Light. You're really beautiful, Lucille. Marty. Something I'll never forget. Yes. Is your light. Thank you, darling. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now back to the Whistler. It was like a whirlpool, the shipwreck, the swirling waters. Marty South, fighting his way through the sea, awakened to find a new life and wealth placed in his hands by Lucille Hastings. But somehow, in the police station at Singapore, that part of the story was a little concerned as the arresting officers huddled around the man sitting under that glaring white light. Come on, Gray. We know you did it. No, no. You've been followed since you asked for that money in Hastings Hotel box. The clerk didn't like your look. And Mr. Hastings gave me the money. He left it for me. What was it for? The killing? No, no. Gray, you were seen firing the gun. How do you think we arrested you so quickly? Oh, I... I... Well, I I did it. But it was Hastings' idea. That's what the money was for. But why did he... I guess Hastings was just tired of everything. He was a weakling. Suicide's been on his mind for months, only he didn't have the nerve. So he hired us, me, to do it for him. 
But why his wife? Oh, too? how do I know? He's crazy about her, I guess. Didn't want anyone else to have her. That's the only reason I can think of why Hastings set up this thing. So they'd both die together. Let that whistle be your signal for the whistler each Sunday night at the same time. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the whistler, Jack Moyle, Betty Lou Gerson, Ted Von Elf, Raymond Burr, and Byron Kane. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen. The story by Joel Malone. Music by Wilbur Hatch. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when this will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Thank you.